Coming up on this episode of Unscripted Faith, it says in the Bible that God has a plan to prosper us, but the topic of prosperity has caused confusion and even harm to many in the church. Our good friend, Dr. Keenan Bridges, is here to join us to share his insight on how we can truly prosper and thrive in this life. Yeah, plus joy and suffering used in the same sentence. Dr. Lena Abu Jamra shares what it means to walk in faith and uncover joy even when going through a season of hurt. This jam-packed episode of Unscripted Faith begins right now. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I am so excited. Yes. We got some bangers yes, in the house do. today. <laughs> Talking about prosperity, the biblical version of it, all that stuff. It's going to be yes. great. From prosperity to suffering, everything in between today. And I don't think, you, you know, to be honest, I don't know if you can have one without the other. Oh. The Bible oh. talks about that. We're going to get Come into on. some of that. It's yeah, going to be are. good. <laughs> well, listen, our next guest is a great friend of ours here at Cornerstone Television Network. He's a powerful man of God, and he's a firm believer that we are meant to prosper. Dr. Keenan Bridges joins us now to tell us why that is. What's up, doctor? How you doing, sir? I'm too blessed to be stressed. I'm good. Come on, <laughs> and come too on. anointed to be disappointed. Oh, <laughs> I, I ain't got another one. I, the only thing I can say to y'all, if I was doing any, I, if people ask me, how you doing? I said, if I'm doing any better, I'd be you. So there's mine. <laughs> I'll throw my little Christianese thing in there. But hey, doctor, it's so great to be with you, man. And Thank uh, you. I want to start off because I don't believe preachers not just the church, should be broke. I don't believe preachers right. are meant to live beneath the status quo. I believe we're called to survive. Matter of fact, I didn't even want to be a preacher because all the preachers I knew were broke and had homely wives. And I just didn't yeah. want any of that life. I just didn't. Tell us what your <laughs> thoughts are about prosperity and the biblical views of that. You know, I, I'm going to say something that is going to maybe shake some people theologically here. So in, in Genesis 1, we know the narrative, uh, the, the account of, in Genesis 1, you know, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. You know, in the Hebrew, it's the words tohu and bohu. It actually means chaos and confusion. And this says, and God said, let there be light. And I want people to pick up a Strong's Concordance or <clears throat> you know, like a Hebrew lexicon. And what you'll find is that one of the words for light there is prosperity. In other words, God said, let there be prosperity. <clears throat> and then he turned, <clears throat> excuse me, he turns around and he says in Genesis 1, 26, says, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Then he says in Genesis uh, 128, let man be fruitful and multiply. So you see that actually the first command God gave creation and the first command God gave humanity was to be fruitful, was to replenish, was to be abundant. And so God is a God of abundance. He's a God of more than enough. In fact, one of his names is El Shaddai, it means the all-sufficient source. And so God is not lacking in any area. And if we're made in his image, neither should we. Well, let me ask you this question then. How, how is it then that the church has a bad theological stance on prosperity? Because we hear a lot of people talking all the time, especially preachers. Let, let, let me ask you this. So start with preachers. Should yeah. preachers be blessed, doctor? Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I look at it like this. If you look at it like a household, right? We're a household of faith. And the Bible talks about if a man can't rule his own house, how can he lead the church of God? So what you think about this? Imagine if a man, all of his children were emaciated, all of his children hadn't eaten in days, their clothes were tattered, their hair was uncomely. You would say that's a bad father, right? And yet we want our leaders to struggle. We want them to be busted, disgusted, and can't be trusted. We want them to pull up to church in a wheelbarrow. And so, and, and then, you know, keep him humble and broke in that way. He's a great pastor. But if he can't take care of himself, how can he lead a whole flock of people? You know, just like if a, if a father can't take care of himself, how can he take care of his wife and his children? 
So we have to be in a position, not only spiritually, but financially, to be able to take care of others. You know, the Bible says we're blessed to be a blessing. So we're supposed to be blessing others. And if you can't even, you know, take care of your daily needs and, and you're struggling and you're always behind and always in need, how can you disciple nations? So let me ask you this, Dr. Keene, why do you believe that there are some who do not prosper and how that impacts the confusion around this entire idea within the church? Well, I, I tell people all the time, the message and the manifestation are correlated, right? Jesus talks about uh, the message of the kingdom. He says over there in Mark chapter 4, he says that the sower sows the word, and that's the word of the kingdom of God. So that word of the kingdom within that word is the potential to bear fruit. But he also deals with four types of soil. He talks about uh, the wayside. He talks about stony ground, thorny ground, and of course, good ground. So a lot of times the reason why people can't receive the fruit is because they've rejected the seed, uh, the seed of the word. And there's a reason for that. Number one, uh, we've seen excesses and abuses in the church. And so that has to be confronted. You know, when we think about prosperity, we have an image that comes to our mind. And sometimes people unconsciously reject the image that they've associated with prosperity. And by doing so, they have rejected the message of prosperity itself. I tell people there's no such thing as a prosperity gospel. There's the gospel. But within the gospel are various messages. There's a message of healing. There's a message of deliverance. There's a message of prosperity, right, that, that are all encompassed within the gospel of the kingdom of God. And so because of our perceptions, negative perceptions, a lot of times people end up inadvertently rejecting the message of prosperity. And the other thing I'll say is I think is interesting is the church has to deal with this very nefarious thing called the vow of poverty. And somehow we have believed and embraced a doctrine that says that the poorer you are, you know, the more wretched your life is, the closer you are to God. And the truth is, I was poor and I wasn't closer to God when I was poor. I mean, in fact, I was upset with him every day. And I think that we have to deconstruct or, or dismantle this narrative that says that, you know what, to be a, a a believer to love the Lord means to be poor, means to be broke, it means to have nothing. I don't find that anywhere in Scripture. Uh, I think that many scriptures are taken out of context to, to, you know, sort of empower this false narrative, and that's why a lot of people end up not receiving the message. You know, Doctor, I've been with you on our fundraisers, and I've seen, I've heard some of your testament about where you were. And now God has blessed you, he's blessed your ministry, he's blessed your personal life. A lot of great things are happening, which we're so thanking God for. But this is the thing that I, where did it start for you? Like where was the turning point where you started coming out of poverty and into prosperity? What happened? Well, the first thing I want to say, I didn't even realize, Pastor Jay, that I had a vow of poverty operating in my life. I had no clue. You know, I grew up middle class. My mother was a teacher. My father worked in a factory, ex-military. Um, we had a decent home that sat on two acres of land. I, I, you know, we were cool. But the issue came when, when I really turned my heart over to the Lord, I had beliefs. I had deeply held beliefs that had not been confronted. And these were spiritual. So the turning point for me came, I'm sitting in a plasma bank. True story, I'm sitting in a plasma bank, about to give plasma to buy food for my wife and my unborn child. As I'm sitting there, the Lord says to me, he says, I literally hear the audible voice of God. He said, what are you doing here? And I said, Lord, I, I'm just trying to, I don't know what else to do. He said, this is not your portion. Amen. And I said, what? He said, this. David said, I was young, and now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread. You know, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not lack. Amen. And so I'm sitting there, and I'm saying, God, then what am I supposed to do? 
and I literally ran out of the plasma bank. I ran out. I go back to my car that was a comprised of three different colors. The hood was one color. The side panels were another color. And I, honestly, that, that car ran on prayer. Some people's cars run on gasoline. Our car ran on prayer. And so I'm in the car with my wife, and she says, what happened? Did you, did you give the plasma? I said, baby, I couldn't. I don't know how we ate that night. I know it was supernatural. But I remember yelling out to the heavens. I said, Lord, teach me how to prosper. Then teach me. If this is not your will, if this yeah. is not what you want from me, then show me. Show me your will. Show me your plans concerning our lives. Mm -hmm. And I went on a journey. And that journey led me to a place of abundance. But it was a challenging journey. I had to confront ideologies, beliefs. I had to confront, my, I had to confront mindsets that had been in my family for generations. Mm -hmm. And once I did, everything began to change. We've got about a minute left, Dr. Keenan, with our time here with you. Uh, what's probably the number one lesson that got you? When he started teaching you, what was the number one thing that you took a hold of and saw immediate results? The first thing he taught me is that it wasn't about me. I had to stop trying to receive a blessing and believe God to become a blessing. So I go into situations now looking how I can give, how I can be a blessing, not just how I can receive something from someone else. Amen. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you're talking about the car there real quickly. I thought Joseph had a coat of many colors. You had a car of many colors. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, brother, we so appreciate you, man. Every time that you come by, whether it's at the fundraiser, on our shows here, you always leave such an impartation and a blessing. Thank you for your time, and we pray God's blessing upon you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you for having me. When we return in 60 seconds, find out what it takes to stand strong when life tries to knock us down. Dr. Lena Abu-Jamra joins us next on Unscripted Faith. God is doing a new thing. Be ready for it. With your best gift today, request Prophetic Reset, a powerful resource by prophetic leader and pastor Joshua Giles. You'll discover a 40-day journey unlike any other, one that will reposition you under God's powerful anointing, deepen your relationship with Him, and propel you forward. Through empowering scriptures, biblical insights, and prophetic tips, you'll discover how to reactivate your spiritual gifts and faith, release the old to seek Him anew, rest your mind in His counsel, and hear His wisdom for your next season. Even more, you'll witness His Word manifest in your life and return to His promises for you. Ask for Prophetic Reset when you give in support of Cornerstone Television today. Every gift helps us to spread the gospel through Christian programming. Call 888-665-4483 or give online at ctvn.org slash donate. Welcome back to Unscripted Faith. What if I told you that following Jesus would be the easiest thing in the world? You'd probably say I'm crazy and you'd be right because it's not easy. And our next guest knows just how difficult it can be. Dr. Lena, welcome to Unscripted Faith. Thanks for having me. It's fun to be here. <laughs> we love it. We're so excited to have you on. Now, Dr. Lena, you have been in uh, medicine and has seen a lot of people suffering up close and personal and yourself have gone through various trials. What is the most difficult moment you have experienced? Whoa. Oh, man. I mean, there's moments I experienced with others in the emergency room, of course, with kids uh, that probably aren't worth talking about here because they're, the platform would be almost too, too rapid to give them justice. But in my own life, I think those are the situations that I've experienced that have made me wrestle with the goodness of God. And so the, the, the biggest one that probably has happened in the last 10 years came, came at the tail of leaving a church that was for a season very vibrant and then went through a very difficult time where uh, the uh, uh, leadership imploded Eventually, the pastor became disqualified. Uh, I left that scene, that time in my life, with so many questions about who God is and his goodness. Um, now I look back and think that was a sort of a season of deconstruction. And I think about uh, what did it take for me to land in a place of deeper faith? And so I've written a lot about that in the last 10 years. Uh, and in my most recent book, of course, I talk about sort of that wrestling of uh, walking through circumstances that you don't see coming in the Christian life when 
uh, you know, you think you're making the right decisions. You think that if you do the right thing, God is going to honor you with good outcomes right away. And you miss the fact that even in our pain, God is deeply at work doing his goodness, doing the things that are for our good and ultimately working out uh, his glory in it. And so I love talking about how God meets us in our pain and how he transforms us, but mostly helps us to know him in a much more deeper and intimate way in the seasons and through the seasons of pain. You know, Dr. Lena, you said something that I want to kind of backtrack just a minute. You know, a lot of churches are having issues with their leadership. Mm -hmm. We're seeing different mm -hmm. Preachers, pastors, even television networks that are battling with things. And you said you had to deconstruct some things when you walked through that. Mm -hmm. What were those areas of deconstruction that maybe some thoughts and beliefs, or ideologies that you had that mm -hmm. God kind of tore down to build back up? You know, uh, that, uh, people hate the word deconstruction because I think sometimes we think it means a process that leaves us refusing God's word and abandoning everything that has to do with God. And in fairness, many who have deconstructed right. no longer hold to the truth of God and his word. And which is why whenever I do talk about deconstruction, I think it's important to know the way not to blow up your faith is to stay at least to a certain degree hearing what God has to say. Our problem and the reason that I deconstructed is that we often twist God's word to suit what we wanted yeah. to mean, and we don't even notice we do it. Yeah. And so we build a sort of prosperity theology that says, if I do right, God will give me what I want. Now, yeah. God will always do right, but sure. we make it, there's a subtle twist in that, yeah. in that, like, if I, as an example, the purity culture was an example of that. If I don't sleep before marriage, if I ha keep my thoughts pure, which incidentally is impossible to do, but we think if I do those things, then God will give me a man to marry that is ideal, and my marriage will be perfect. And so we have a lot of people who have woken up from the purity you know, movement back in the 80s and 90s and thought, man, didn't that, didn't, that didn't happen to me. My husband left, my, you know, my this, that happened, my kids, didn't, I didn't have kids, all the things that we thought would be our right. And I think in a sense, the purity culture was established on a premise of prosperity. Same thing happened in my life in the church back when the leadership imploded. I think I thought for a while that if I went to church, if I honored God, if I read my Bible, if I did all the things, then I would be spared the pain that other Christians were going through. Somehow, wow. that obedience would spare me the pain. But throughout Scripture, as an example, Joseph uh, is a classic example of that yes. in the book of Genesis, who escapes the adulterous relationship, you know, runs for his life. And what happens to him? He Still gets accused of rape and gets thrown in prison. Yeah. And so throughout Scripture, we see that model where people suffer pain and it has nothing to do with how good we are. Mm -hmm. The other big idea that I had to drop was sort of equating God with spiritual leaders. And I think we do that, again, subconsciously. Uh, we sort of start, we, we, we lose sight of God in our effort to honor the leaders in our church. Leaders ought to be honored, but God is still the one we ought to worship. And I think in 2024, in an age of social media and celebrity culture, it's very easy for Christians to fall into the same human traps of idolizing leaders when we should only be idolizing God. And so there were things in my life that I think I um, put faith in uh, instead of trusting only in the Lord, that that season of breaking down relationships and removing things that I was relying on, uh, my measures of success, my measures of significance were removed in, in a long season of about 10 years that led me to understand what it truly means to find in the Lord my all. And I would not take that season back for anything. Trust in the Lord truly is critical for believers, you know, whether they're at their peak or they're in the midst of deconstruction. But let me ask you a question. Can joy and suffering coexist? I mean, one word, Jesus, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, Hebrews 12 talks about that, you know, for the joy set before him endured the cross. That summarizes it right there. Yeah. But yeah, we think, again, I think that the temptation is to think, well, because Jesus suffered, I'll never have to. Yeah. But that's not what he taught us. He says, in this world, you will have trouble. Uh, rejoice in suffering. His brother, his half-brother of Jesus wrote in James. So we know suffering has a place in our life. I think it just doesn't define us. What defines us is that our joy ought to be rooted in the person of Christ, which is why if our eyes are on the outcome, if we're constantly coming to the Lord, and by the way, I've spent decades of my Christian life in that world. It's easy to do. 
That's why I write about this topic is because you can spend so much time tying God's goodness with getting me out of the season of suffering, getting past the waiting, that we sort of miss the fact that nothing may change in life and you still have access to 100% of Christ and the joy that he gives you, even if you remain in the prison. Joseph's story wasn't powerful back in the Bible in Genesis because Joseph got out of prison. Yeah, that's cool. That made for a good Hollywood play, but Joseph was content to be in the prison. His joy was complete in Christ. When Pharaoh asked him, can you interpret the dream? He didn't respond in bitterness. He didn't respond in anger. He said, there is a God who interprets dreams. Yes, King, I will tell you there is the dream, not for your sake, but because God is the one who interprets dreams. And so that is the essence of joy. And I think that's what I long for anyone who reads anything or watches my life to see that is what God has and continues to be working in me. It is not easy. And I have had to learn kicking and screaming. I'm much more like Jacob, who's walking with a limp because you just can't get God to understand your point of view. (laughs) But I think at the end of the day, uh, the Lord in his grace still meets us right where we are and gets us out of our pit into a place where he puts our feet in a broad place and gives us the joy that is ours in Christ. You know, Doctor, I think a lot of people misconstrue that whole story with Joseph, too. I lo- Matter of fact, you, you're, you're all up in my head right now, by the way. I mean, I, everything I was going to say, I was like, she preaching that, she preaching that. I was like, so you, I, doctoring must be your day job and preaching will be your night job because you definitely got some preacher in you. But I was thinking about that story with Joseph because I think the greatest miracle is also, with your point, that he was in prison convicted of rape. Mm-hmm. Imagine yeah. somebody in America yeah. being convicted of rape and then being vice president. Yeah in a day. I mean, that's kind of like what it was. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think about the hardest years for Joseph may not have been the prison years. Honestly, I think the hardest years, I always tell when I do teach that and I do teach God's word wherever he and whenever he gives me a chance to do so, I think the hardest years were those first seven years of plenty. And I think his entire life led him to have the strength for those years, because what you said is 100% true. Imagine for seven years of plenty before the famine, all of the people going, dude, there's a guy who was just in prison for yeah, rape, and now yeah. he's this, and, and he's a Hebrew in Egypt. And, and how much yeah, talk wow. about him in those wow. seven years that he have to endure until by faith, seven years later, when the famine came, yeah. then people were like, oh my goodness, look, he was speaking the truth. They didn't believe in his God. They didn't trust what he said was true. And imagine how much resilience and, and strength of, of soul and mind and heart and confidence in the Lord he had to have during those seven years to be able to endure all of the accusations and things that came against him. So true. Dr. Lena, you are a wealth of wisdom, woman. I, I want to keep going, you know. Seriously, well, let's just keep this let- going right now. <laughs> you got us wanting to take laps here in the studio. <laughs> I'm pumped up, man. I know. I'm excited about it myself. I mean, we're going into Christmas, and there's so many pressures to be like the world. We have to think like Christ. We have to think biblically. And, and listen, I know, listen, it might sound like it comes natural. It doesn't. I have had... This, that's why I write books, because it has been a battle, a wrestling match to be able to stand up and say, God is good. Yeah. It is not a glib thing that we repeat in church because it sounds good and has a rhyme. It is the truth. Even if you're hurting right now, the Lord is good. He sees you. He knows you. He has a plan for your life and he is getting you through it and he will be with you in it until the end, until you see him face to face. And that is the promise of Christianity at the end of the day. Oh, thank you, Dr. Lena, and we pray blessings over you, and we pray for many more doctors like you. (laughs) Amen. I want you as my physician. Yeah, for real. Come on. (laughs) Thank you for being with us. Thanks for having me. When we come back, we're going to tackle the difficult question often asked about why God allows suffering. You're going to want to hear what Jake and I have to say about it when we return after this short break. Welcome to Dashing Dish. It's Thanksgiving and we're busy in the kitchen, preparing those classic sides with a healthier spin. Clean eating green bean casserole, cornbread muffins with a secret ingredient, mouth-watering sweet potato casserole, and mini pumpkin pies that are only 35 calories. Make Cornerstone Network your home for the best in local Christian TV, bringing you programs like... You're going to find freedom. You're going to find healing. You're going to find a clear conscience. You're going to find ways that you're hearing God in the the ways you've never heard Him before. You hang in there. He's a God who never, ever lets us go, ever. We left the light on for you. 
Cornerstone Network is your home for Christian television. Welcome home. Welcome back to Unscripted Faith. And we have been having a phenomenal conversation here, Jay. We talked about prosperity and we talked about suffering. Yeah. And both are necessary and needed in our lives. Mm -hmm. But a question I think a lot of believers wrestle with is why would God allow this suffering in my life? Is this our questions? This is our question this is for our you. Questions? Okay, where's my hard question stuff at? <laughs> uh, well, you know, I, I think suffering is the primary prerequisite for greatness. Mm -hmm. You won't find anybody in scripture that didn't suffer. Matter of fact, Jesus, think about yeah. it. Suffering has nothing to do with righteousness or Jesus wouldn't have suffered. That's right. The Bible says That's in right. Hebrews, he learned obedience yeah. by what he suffered. I think the greater that you're called, the more suffering you'll entertain. Uh, suffering does a lot of things for us. It teaches us the principles of God. It teaches us our dependency upon him. It, um, it, 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 it helps us to be able to empathize and or sympathize with the yes. people that we're going to minister to. Yes. Matter of fact, when the priests were uh, be chosen in the Old Testament, they had to be taken from amongst the people. Come so on. then he understood how to make uh, intercession and to be able to stand in the gap and to make the sacrifices for the people. So yeah. I believe that's what makes you great. Matter of fact, I don't even like the fact that a lot of these kids nowadays, I don't know how it is with yours, but everybody gets a trophy now. Yeah, everybody's number one. Yeah, I'm like, participate. Why you get a trophy for yeah, participation? You just right. showed up. That's I was like, right. you get a trophy. What made me great in life was yes. suffering. It was when Come people on. told me I couldn't and when I was pushed down. It doesn't feel good at the time, no. but that's what makes you great. It develops. She mentioned about that resiliency and yes. all of that. All of that is how we become great and it's through the suffering that we have. Yeah, I agree. And I think there are very physical um, examples we can use of that. You know, when we go to the gym, after you lift and you yeah. lift hard, you yeah. feel weak. Yep. But what has actually happened is your body's actually building itself, yeah. right? And so yep. I, I do think that God uses our suffering and he allows it to shape us and to change us. And, you know, I'm often reminded when I think of suffering, obviously I always go to the book of Job, right, you know, right. and it's like, you know, many people are like, why, 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 why? Well, God didn't ultimately give him an answer as to why, but he asked Job, were you there when I set the boundaries? You know, so like we may not get an answer to the why something is happening in our life or why we don't ever necessarily see breakthrough in a certain area in our life, but we can rest assured that God is good in That's the right. midst of it all. Well, you know, you take a look at what Dr. Keenan talked about, teach me yes. how to prosper. You mentioned about Job. Job, yes. he got double. 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 I really believe God, God will never let you suffer right. and not make it up to you. That's right. Because that would make him servant to you. Yes. Because it's an insult for a king to have given less than whoever it is that's come underneath on. him. Yeah. So I believe that that's kind of the way that we come into prosperity as well is through, through the gate of suffering. Yeah. And I, I like that you mentioned that because I think some people, um, one of the things that Dr. Lena said was we tie it to the outcome. Oh, well, well, I trust God for the outcome, for the outcome. But we may not see that blessing or that great redemption on this side of heaven. That's right. You know, but God promises beauty for ashes. And Jay, you know, one thing that I really love is how Paul in scripture talks about how light his afflictions were were in comparison to the glory that was being revealed and would be revealed. And I really believe that God is so redemptive and so kind that he will redeem even the darkest moments on this earth in heaven. Stay tuned, he's got more. Cornerstone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.